The Apostate, a short story by Jack London. Now I wake me up to work. I pray the Lord I may not shirk. If I should die before the night, I pray the Lord my work's all right. Amen. If you don't get up, Johnny, I won't give you a bite to eat. The threat had no effect on the boy. He clung stubbornly to sleep, fighting for its oblivion as the dreamer fights for his dream. The boy's hands loosely clenched themselves, and he made feeble, spasmodic blows at the air. These blows were intended for his mother, but she betrayed practiced familiarity in avoiding them as she shook him roughly by the shoulder. Let me alone! It was a cry that began, muffled, in the deeps of sleep, that swiftly rushed upward like a wail into passionate belligerence, and that died away and sank down into an inarticulate whine. It was a bestial cry, as of a soul in torment, filled with infinite protest and pain. But she did not mind. She was a sad-eyed, tired-faced woman, and she had grown used to this task, which she repeated every day of her life. She got a grip on the bedclothes and tried to strip them down, but the boy, ceasing his punching, clung to them desperately. In a huddle, at the foot of the bed, he still remained covered. Then she tried dragging the bedding to the floor. The boy opposed her. She braced herself. Hers was the superior weight, and the boy and bedding gave, the former instinctively following the latter in order to shelter against the chill of the room that bit into his body. As he toppled on the edge of the bed, it seemed that he must fall head first to the floor, but consciousness fluttered up in him. He righted himself, and for a moment, perilously balanced. Then he struck the floor on his feet. On the instant, his mother seized him by the shoulders and shook him. Again, his fists struck out, this time with more force and directness. At the same time, his eyes opened. She released him. He was awake. All right, he mumbled. She caught up the lamp and hurried out, leaving him in darkness. You'll be docked, she warned back to him. He did not mind the darkness. When he had got into his clothes, he went out into the kitchen. His tread was very heavy for so thin and light a boy. His legs dragged with their own weight, which seemed unreasonable because they were such skinny legs. He drew a broken bottom chair to the table. Johnny, his mother called sharply. He arose as sharply from the chair and without a word went to the sink. It was a greasy, filthy sink. A smell came up from the outlet. He took no notice of it. That a sink should smell was to him part of the natural order, just as it was a part of the natural order that the soap should be grimy with dishwater and hard to lather. Nor did he try very hard to make it lather. Several splashes of the cold water from the running faucet completed the function. He did not wash his teeth. For that matter, he had never seen a toothbrush, nor did he know that there existed beings in the world who were guilty of so great a foolishness as tooth washing. You might wash yourself once a day without being told, his mother complained. She was holding a broken lid on the pot as she poured two cups of coffee. He made no remark, for this was a standing quarrel between them, and the one thing upon which his mother was hard as adamant. Wunst, a day it was compulsory that he should wash his face. He dried himself on a greasy towel, damp and dirty and ragged, that left his face covered with shreds of lint. I wish we didn't live so far away, she said as he sat down. I try to do the best I can. You know that. But a dollar on the rent is such a saving, and we've more room here. You know that. He scarcely followed her. He had heard it all before, many times. The range of her thought was limited, and she was ever harking back to the hardship worked upon them by living so far from the mills. A dollar means more grub, he remarked sententiously. I'd sooner do the walking and get the grub. He ate hurriedly, half chewing the bread and washing the unmasticated chunks down with coffee. The hot and muddy liquid went by the name of coffee. Johnny thought it was coffee, and excellent coffee. That was one of the few of life's illusions that remained to him. He had never drunk real coffee in his life. In addition to the bread, there was a small piece of cold pork. His mother refilled his cup with coffee. As he was finishing the bread, he began to watch if more was forthcoming. She intercepted his questioning glance. Now don't be hoggish, Johnny, 
was her comment. You've had your share. Your brothers and sisters are smaller than you. He did not answer the rebuke. He was not much of a talker. Also, he ceased his hungry glancing for more. He was uncomplaining, with a patience that was as terrible as the school in which it had been learned. He finished his coffee, wiped his mouth on the back of his hand, and started to rise. Wait a second, she said hastily. I guess the loafkin stand you another slice. A thin iron. There was ledger domain in her actions. With all the seeming of cutting a slice from the loaf for him, she put loaf and slice back in the bread box and conveyed to him one of her own two slices. She believed she had deceived him, but he had noted her sleight of hand. Nevertheless, he took the bread shamelessly. He had a philosophy that his mother, because of her chronic sickliness, was not much of an eater anyway. She saw that he was chewing the bread dry and reached over and emptied her coffee cup into his. Don't set good somehow on my stomach this morning, she explained. A distant whistle, prolonged and shrieking, brought both of them to their feet. She glanced at the tin alarm clock on the shelf. The hands stood at half past five. The rest of the factory world was just arousing from sleep. She drew a shawl about her shoulders, and on her head put a dingy hat, shapeless and ancient. We've got to run, she said, turning the wick of the lamp and blowing down the chimney. They groped their way out and down the stairs. It was clear and cold, and Johnny shivered at the first contact with the outside air. The stars had not yet begun to pale in the sky, and the city lay in blackness. Both Johnny and his mother shuffled their feet as they walked. There was no ambition in the leg muscles to swing the feet clear of the ground. After fifteen silent minutes, his mother turned off to the right. Don't be late, was her final warning from out of the dark that was swallowing her up. He made no response, steadily keeping on his way. In the factory quarter, doors were opening everywhere, and he was soon one of a multitude that pressed onward through the dark. As he entered the factory gate, the whistle blew again. He glanced at the east. Across a ragged skyline of housetops, a pale light was beginning to creep. This much he saw of the day as he turned his back upon it and joined his work gang. He took his place in one of many long rows of machines. Before him, above a bin filled with small bobbins, were large bobbins revolving rapidly. Upon these he wound the jute twine of the small bobbins. The work was simple. All that was required was celerity. The small bobbins were emptied so rapidly, and there were so many large bobbins that did the emptying, that there were no idle moments. He worked mechanically. When a small bobbin ran out, he used his left hand for a break, stopping the large bobbin, and at the same time, with thumb and forefinger, catching the flying end of twine. Also, at the same time, with his right hand, he caught up the loose twine end of a small bobbin. These various acts with both hands were performed simultaneously and swiftly. Then there would come a flash of his hands as he looped the weaver's knot and released the bobbin. There was nothing difficult about weaver's knots. He once boasted he could tie them in his sleep, and for that matter, he sometimes did toiling centuries long in a single night at tying an endless succession of weaver's knots. Some of the boys shirked, wasting time and machinery by not replacing the small bobbins when they ran out, and there was an overseer to prevent this. He caught Johnny's neighbour at the trick and boxed his ears. Look at Johnny there, why ain't you like him? the overseer wrathfully demanded. Johnny's bobbins were running full blast, but he did not thrill at the indirect praise. There had been a time, but that was long ago, very long ago. His apathetic face was expressionless as he listened to himself being held up as a shining example. He was the perfect worker. He knew that. He had been told so often. It was a commonplace, and besides, it didn't seem to mean anything to him anymore. From the perfect worker, he had evolved into the perfect machine. When his work went wrong, it was with him, as with the machine, due to faulty material. It would have been as possible for a perfect nail die to cut imperfect nails as for him to make a mistake, and small wonder. There had never been a time when he had not been in intimate relationship with machines. 
Machinery had almost been bred into him, and at any rate, he had been brought up on it. Twelve years before, there had been a small flutter of excitement in the loom room of this very mill. Johnny's mother had fainted. They stretched her out on the floor in the midst of the shrieking machines. A couple of elderly women were called from their looms. The foreman assisted. And in a few minutes, there was one more soul in the loom room than had entered by the doors. It was Johnny born with the pounding, crashing roar of the looms in his ears, drawing with his first breath the warm, moist air that was thick with flying lint. He had coughed that first day in order to rid his lungs of the lint, and for the same reason he had coughed ever since. The boy alongside of Johnny whimpered and sniffed. The boy's face was convulsed with hatred for the overseer, who kept a threatening eye on him from a distance, but every bobbin was running full. The boy yelled terrible oaths into the whirling bobbins before him, but the sound did not carry half a dozen feet, the roaring of the room holding it in and containing it like a wall. Of all this, Johnny took no notice. He had a way of accepting things. Besides, things grow monotonous by repetition, and this particular happening he had witnessed many times. It seemed to him as useless to oppose the overseer as to defy the will of a machine. Machines were made to go in certain ways and to perform certain tasks. It was the same with the overseer. But at eleven o'clock, there was excitement in the room. In an apparently occult way, the excitement instantly permeated everywhere. The one-legged boy who worked on the other side of Johnny bobbed swiftly across the floor to a bin truck that stood empty. Into this, he dived out of sight, crutch and all. The superintendent of the mill was coming along, accompanied by a young man. He was well-dressed and wore a starched shirt. A gentleman in Johnny's classification of men, and also the inspector. He looked sharply at the boys as he passed along. Sometimes he stopped and asked questions. When he did so, he was compelled to shout at the top of his lungs at which. Moments his face was ludicrously contorted with the strain of making himself heard, his quick eye noted the empty machine alongside of Johnny's, but he said nothing. Johnny also caught his eye, and he stopped abruptly. He caught Johnny by the arm to draw him back a step from the machine, but with an exclamation of surprise, he released the arm. Pretty skinny, the superintendent laughed anxiously. Pipe stems, was the answer. Look at those legs. The boy's got the rickets. Incipient, but he's got them. If epilepsy doesn't get him in the end, it will be because tuberculosis gets him first. Johnny listened, but did not understand. Furthermore, he was not interested in future ills. There was an immediate and more serious ill that threatened him in the form of the inspector. Now, my boy, I want you to tell me the truth, the inspector said, or shouted, bending close to the boy's ear to make him hear. How old are you? Fourteen, Johnny lied, and he lied with the full force of his lungs. So loudly did he lie that it started him off in a dry, hacking cough that lifted the lint which had been settling in his lungs all morning. Look sixteen at least, said the superintendent. Or sixty, snapped the inspector. He's always looked that way. How long? asked the inspector quickly. For years? Never gets a bit older. Or younger, I dare say. I suppose he's worked here all those years. Off and on, but that was before the new law was passed, the superintendent hastened to add. Machine idle, the inspector asked, pointing at the unoccupied machine beside Johnny's, in which the part-filled bobbins were flying like mad. Looks that way. The superintendent motioned the overseer to him and shouted in his ear and pointed at the machine. Machines idle he reported back to the inspector. They passed on, and Johnny returned to his work, relieved in that the ill had been averted. But the one-legged boy was not so fortunate. The sharp-eyed inspector hailed him out at arm's length from the bin truck. His lips were quivering, and his face had all the expression of one upon whom was fallen profound and irremediable disaster. The overseer looked astounded, as though for the first time he had laid eyes on the boy while the superintendent's face expressed shock and displeasure. I know him, the inspector said. He's twelve years old. 
I've had him discharged from three factories inside the year. This makes the fourth. He turned to the one-legged boy. You promised me, word and honour, that you'd go to school. The one-legged boy burst into tears. Please, Mr Inspector, two babies died on us, and we're awful poor. What makes you cough that way? The inspector demanded, as though charging him with crime. And as in denial of guilt, the one-legged boy replied, It ain't nothing. I just caught a cold last week, Mr Inspector. That's all. In the end, the one-legged boy went out of the room with the inspector, the latter accompanied by the anxious and protesting superintendent. After that, monotony settled down again. The long morning and the longer afternoon wore away, and the whistle blew for quitting time. Darkness had already fallen when Johnny passed out through the factory gate. In the interval, the sun had made a golden ladder of the sky, flooded the world with its gracious warmth, and dropped down and disappeared in the west behind a ragged skyline of housetops. Supper was the family meal of the day, the one meal at which Johnny encountered his younger brothers and sisters. It partook of the nature of an encounter to him, for he was very old while they were distressingly young. He had no patience with their excessive and amazing juvenility. He did not understand it. His own childhood was too far behind him. He was like an old and irritable man, annoyed by the turbulence of their young spirits that was to him arrant silliness. He glowered silently over his food, finding compensation in the thought that they would soon have to go to work. That would take the edge off of them and make them sedate and dignified like him. Thus it was, after the fashion of the human, that Johnny made of himself a yardstick with which to measure the universe. During the meal, his mother explained in various ways, and with infinite repetition, that she was trying to do the best she could, so that it was with relief the scant meal ended, that Johnny shoved back his chair and arose. He debated for a moment between bed and the front door, and finally, went out the latter. He did not go far. He sat down on the stoop, his knees drawn up, and his narrow shoulders drooping forward, his elbows on his knees and the palms of his hands supporting his chin. As he sat there, he did no thinking. He was just resting. So far as his mind was concerned, it was asleep. His brothers and sisters came out, and with other children played noisily about him. An electric globe at the corner lighted their frolics. He was peevish and irritable that they knew, but the spirit of adventure lured them into teasing him. They joined hands before him, and keeping time with their bodies, chanted in his face weird and uncomplimentary doggerel. At first he snarled curses at them, curses he had learned from the lips of various foremen. Finding this futile and remembering his dignity, he relapsed into dogged silence. His brother Will, next to him in age, having just passed his tenth birthday, was the ringleader. Johnny did not possess particularly kindly feelings toward him. His life had early been embittered by continual giving over and giving way to Will. He had a definite feeling that Will was greatly in his debt and was ungrateful about it. In his own playtime, far back in the dim past, he had been robbed of a large part of that playtime by being compelled to take care of Will. Will was a baby then, and then, as now, their mother had spent her days in the mills. To Johnny had fallen the part of little father and little mother as well. Will seemed to show the benefit of the giving over and the giving way. He was well built, fairly rugged, as tall as his elder brother and even heavier. It was as though the lifeblood of the one had been diverted into the other's veins, and in spirit it was the same. Johnny was jaded, worn out, without resilience, while his younger brother seemed bursting and spilling over with exuberance. The mocking chant rose louder and louder. Will leaned closer as he danced, thrusting out his tongue. Johnny's left arm shot out and caught the other around the neck. At the same time, he wrapped his bony fist to the other's nose. It was a pathetically bony fist, but that it was sharp to hurt was evidenced by the squeal of pain it produced. The other children were uttering frightened cries, while Johnny's sister, Jenny, had dashed into the house. 
He thrust Will from him, kicked him savagely on the shins, then reached for him and slammed him face downward in the dirt. Nor did he release him till the face had been rubbed into the dirt several times. Then the mother arrived, an anemic whirlwind of solicitude and maternal wrath. Why can't he leave me alone? was Johnny's reply to her upbraiding. Can't he see I'm tired? I'm as big as you, Will raged in her arms, his face a mass of tears, dirt and blood. I'm as big as you now, and I'm going to get bigger. Then I'll lick you, see if I don't. You ought to be to work, seeing how big you are, Johnny snarled. That's what's the matter with you. You ought to be to work, and it's up to your ma to put you to work. But he's too young, she protested. He's only a little boy. I was younger than him when I started to work. Johnny's mouth was open, further to express the sense of unfairness that he felt, but the mouth closed with a snap. He turned gloomily on his heel and stalked into the house and to bed. The door of his room was open to let in warmth from the kitchen. As he undressed in the semi-darkness, he could hear his mother talking with a neighbour woman who had dropped in. His mother was crying, and her speech was punctuated with spiritless sniffles. I can't make out what's getting into Johnny, he could hear her say. He didn't used to be this way. He was a patient little angel. And he is a good boy, she hastened to defend. He's worked faithful, and he did go to work too young. But it wasn't my fault. I do the best I can, I'm sure. Prolonged sniffling from the kitchen, and Johnny murmured to himself as his eyelids closed down, You bet your life, I've worked faithful. The next morning he was torn bodily by his mother from the grip of sleep. Then came the meagre breakfast, the tramp through the dark, and the pale glimpse of day across the housetops as he turned his back on it and went in through the factory gate. It was another day of all the days, and all the days were alike. And yet, there had been variety in his life. At the times he changed from one job to another, or was taken sick. When he was six, he was little mother and father to Will, and the other children still younger. At seven, he went into the mills, winding bobbins. When he was eight, he got work in another mill. His new job was marvellously easy. All he had to do was to sit down with a little stick in his hand and guide a stream of cloth that flowed past him. This stream of cloth came out of the moor of a machine, passed over a hot roller, and went on its way elsewhere. But he sat always in one place, beyond the reach of daylight, a gas jet flaring over him, himself part of the mechanism. He was very happy at that job, in spite of the moist heat, for he was still young and in possession of dreams and illusions, and wonderful dreams he dreamed as he watched the steaming cloth streaming endlessly by. But there was no exercise about the work, no call upon his mind, and he dreamed less and less while his mind grew torpid and drowsy. Nevertheless, he earned two dollars a week, and two dollars represented the difference between acute starvation and chronic underfeeding. But when he was nine, he lost his job. Measles was the cause of it. After he recovered, he got work in a glass factory. The pay was better, and the work demanded skill. It was piecework, and the more skillful he was, the bigger wages he earned. Here was incentive. And under this incentive, he developed into a remarkable worker. It was simple work, the tying of glass stoppers into small bottles. At his waist, he carried a bundle of twine. He held the bottles between his knees so that he might work with both hands. Thus, in a sitting position and bending over his own knees, his narrow shoulders grew humped and his chest was contracted for ten hours each day. This was not good for the lungs, but he tied three hundred dozen bottles a day. The superintendent was very proud of him and brought visitors to look at him. In ten hours, three hundred dozen bottles passed through his hands. This meant that he had attained machine-like perfection. All waste movements were eliminated. Every motion of his thin arms, every movement of a muscle in the thin fingers, was swift and accurate. He worked at high tension, and the result was that he grew nervous. At night his muscles twitched in his sleep, and in the daytime he could not relax and rest. He remained keyed up, and his muscles continued to twitch. 
Also, he grew sallow, and his lint cough grew worse. Then pneumonia laid hold of the feeble lungs within the contracted chest, and he lost his job in the glassworks. Now he had returned to the jute mills where he had first begun with winding bobbins. But promotion was waiting for him. He was a good worker. He would next go on the starcher, and later he would go into the loom room. There was nothing after that except increased efficiency. The machinery ran faster than when he had first gone to work, and his mind ran slower. He no longer dreamed at all, though his earlier years had been full of dreaming. Once he had been in love. It was when he first began guiding the cloth over the hot roller, and it was with the daughter of the superintendent. She was much older than he, a young woman, and he had seen her at a distance only a paltry half-dozen times. But that made no difference. On the surface of the cloth stream that poured past him, he pictured radiant futures wherein he performed prodigies of toil, invented miraculous machines, won to the mastership of the mills, and in the end took her in his arms and kissed her soberly on the brow. But that was all in the long ago, before he had grown too old and tired to love. Also, she had married and gone away, and his mind had gone to sleep. Yet it had been a wonderful experience, and he used often to look back upon it as other men and women look back upon the time they believed in fairies. He had never believed in fairies nor Santa Claus, but he had believed implicitly in the smiling future his imagination had wrought into the steaming cloth stream. He had become a man very early in life. At seven, when he drew his first wages, began his adolescence. A certain feeling of independence crept up in him, and the relationship between him and his mother changed. Somehow, as an earner and breadwinner, doing his own work in the world, he was more like an equal with her. Manhood, full-blown manhood, had come when he was eleven, at which time he had gone to work on the night shift for six months. No child works on the night shift and remains a child. There had been several great events in his life. One of these had been when his mother bought some California prunes. Two others had been the two times when she cooked custard. Those had been events. He remembered them kindly. And at that time, his mother had told him of a blissful dish she would sometime make, floating island. She had called it better than custard. For years, he had looked forward to the day when he would sit down to the table with floating island before him, until at last, he had relegated the idea of it to the limbo of unattainable ideals. Once, he found a silver quarter lying on the sidewalk. That, also, was a great event in his life, with all a tragic one. He knew his duty on the instant the silver flashed on his eyes, before even he had picked it up. At home, as usual, there was not enough to eat, and home he should have taken it as he did his wages every Saturday night. Right conduct in this case was obvious, but he never had any spending of his money, and he was suffering from candy hunger. He was ravenous for the sweets that only on red-letter days he had ever tasted in his life. He did not attempt to deceive himself. He knew it was sin, and deliberately he sinned when he went on a fifteen-cent candy debauch. Ten cents he saved for a future orgy, but not being accustomed to the carrying of money, he lost the ten cents. This occurred at the time when he was suffering all the torments of conscience and it was to him an act of divine retribution. He had a frightened sense of the closeness of an awful and wrathful God. God had seen, and God had been swift to punish, denying him even the full wages of sin. In memory he always looked back upon that as the one great criminal deed of his life, and at the recollection his conscience always awoke and gave him another twinge. It was the one skeleton in his closet. Also, being so made and circumstanced, he looked back upon the deed with regret. He was dissatisfied with the manner in which he had spent the quarter. He could have invested it better, and, out of his later knowledge of the quickness of God, he would have beaten God out by spending the whole quarter at one fell swoop. In retrospect, he spent the quarter a thousand times, and each time to better advantage. There was one other memory of the past, dim and faded, but stamped into his soul everlasting by the savage feet of his father. It was more like a nightmare than a remembered vision of a concrete thing, 
more like the race memory of man that makes him fall in his sleep, and that goes back to his arboreal ancestry. This particular memory never came to Johnny in broad daylight when he was wide awake. It came at night, in bed, at the moment that his consciousness was sinking down and losing itself in sleep. It always aroused him to frightened wakefulness, and for the moment, in the first sickening start, it seemed to him that he lay crosswise on the foot of the bed. In the bed were the vague forms of his father and mother. He never saw what his father looked like. He had but one impression of his father, and that was that he had savage and pitiless feet. His earlier memories lingered with him, but he had no late memories. All days were alike. Yesterday or last year were the same as a thousand years, or a minute. Nothing ever happened. There were no events to mark the march of time. Time did not march. It stood always still. It was only the whirling machines that moved, and they moved nowhere, in spite of the fact that they moved faster. When he was fourteen, he went to work on the starcher. It was a colossal event. Something had at last happened that could be remembered beyond a night's sleep or a week's payday. It marked an era. It was a machine Olympiad, a thing to date from. When I went to work on the starcher, or after, or before I went to work on the starcher, were sentences often on his lips. He celebrated his sixteenth birthday by going into the loom room and taking a loom. Here was an incentive again, for it was piecework and he excelled because the clay of him had been moulded by the mills into the perfect machine. At the end of three months, he was running two looms, and later, three and four. At the end of his second year at the looms, he was turning out more yards than any other weaver, and more than twice as much as some of the less skilful ones. And at home, things began to prosper as he approached the full stature of his earning power. Not, however, that his increased earnings were in excess of need. The children were growing up. They ate more, and they were going to school, and school books cost money. And somehow, the faster he worked, the faster climbed the prices of things. Even the rent went up, though the house had fallen from bad to worse disrepair. He had grown taller, but with his increased height, he seemed leaner than ever. Also, he was more nervous. With the nervousness increased his peevishness and irritability. The children had learned by many bitter lessons to fight shy of him. His mother respected him for his earning power, but somehow her respect was tinctured with fear. There was no joyousness in life for him. The procession of the days he never saw. The nights he slept away in twitching unconsciousness. The rest of the time he worked, and his consciousness was machine consciousness. Outside this, his mind was a blank. He had no ideals and but one illusion, namely that he drank excellent coffee. He was a work beast. He had no mental life whatever. Yet deep down in the crypts of his mind, unknown to him, were being weighed and sifted every hour of his toil, every movement of his hands, every twitch of his muscles, and preparations were making for a future course of action that would amaze him and all his little world. It was in the late spring that he came home from work one night, aware of unusual tiredness. There was a keen expectancy in the air as he sat down to the table, but he did not notice. He went through the meal in moody silence, mechanically eating what was before him. The children ummed and ahed and made smacking noises with their mouths, but he was deaf to them. Do you know what you're eating? his mother demanded at last, desperately. He looked vacantly at the dish before him and vacantly at her. Floating island, she announced triumphantly. Oh, he said. Floating island, the children chorused loudly. Oh, he said, and after two or three mouthfuls he added, I guess I ain't hungry tonight. He dropped the spoon, shoved back his chair, and arose wearily from the table. And I guess I'll go to bed. His feet dragged more heavily than usual as he crossed the kitchen floor. Undressing was a titan's task, a monstrous futility, and he wept weakly as he crawled into bed, one shoe still on. He was aware of a rising, swelling something inside his head that made his brain thick and fuzzy. His lean fingers felt as big as his wrist, 
while in the ends of them was a remoteness of sensation, vague and fuzzy like his brain. The small of his back ached intolerably. All his bones ached. He ached everywhere, and in his head began the shrieking, pounding, crashing, roaring of a million looms. All space was filled with flying shuttles. They darted in and out, intricately, amongst the stars. He worked a thousand looms himself, and ever they speeded up, faster and faster, and his brain unwound, faster and faster, and became the thread that fed the thousand flying shuttles. He did not go to work next morning. He was too busy weaving colossally on the thousand looms that ran inside his head. His mother went to work, but first she sent for the doctor. It was a severe attack of la grippe, he said. Jenny served as nurse and carried out his instructions. It was a very severe attack, and it was a week before Johnny dressed and tottered feebly across the floor. Another week, the doctor said, and he would be fit to return to work. The foreman of the loom room visited him on Sunday afternoon, the first day of his convalescence. The best weaver in the room, the foreman told his mother. His job would be held for him. He could come back to work a week from Monday. Why don't you thank him, Johnny? His mother asked anxiously. He's been that sick he ain't himself yet, she explained apologetically to the visitor. Johnny sat hunched up and gazing steadfastly at the floor. He sat in the same position long after the foreman had gone. It was warm outdoors, and he sat on the stoop in the afternoon. Sometimes his lips moved. He seemed lost in endless calculations. Next morning, after the day grew warm, he took his seat on the stoop. He had pencil and paper this time with which to continue his calculations, and he calculated painfully and amazingly. What comes after millions? he asked at noon, when Will came home from school. And how do you work them? That afternoon finished his task. Each day, but without paper and pencil, he returned to the stoop. He was greatly absorbed in the one tree that grew across the street. He studied it for hours at a time, and was unusually interested when the wind swayed its branches and fluttered its leaves. Throughout the week, he seemed lost in a great communion with himself. On Sunday, Sitting on the stoop, he laughed aloud, several times, to the perturbation of his mother, who had not heard him laugh for years. Next morning, in the early darkness, she came to his bed to rouse him. He had had his fill of sleep all the week, and awoke easily. He made no struggle, nor did he attempt to hold on to the bedding when she stripped it from him. He lay quietly, and spoke quietly. It ain't no use, Ma. You'll be late she said, under the impression that he was still stupid with sleep. I'm awake, Ma, and I tell you it ain't no use. You might as well let me alone. I ain't going to get up. But you'll lose your job, she cried. I ain't going to get up, he repeated in a strange, passionless voice. She didn't go to work herself that morning. This was sickness beyond any sickness she had ever known. Fever and delirium she could understand, but this was insanity. She pulled the bedding up over him and sent Jenny for the doctor. When that person arrived, Johnny was sleeping gently, and gently he awoke and allowed his pulse to be taken. Nothing the matter with him, the doctor reported. Badly debilitated, that's all. Not much meat on his bones. He's always been that way, his mother volunteered. Now go away, Ma, and let me finish my snooze. Johnny spoke sweetly and placidly, and sweetly and placidly he rolled over on his side and went to sleep. At ten o'clock he awoke and dressed himself. He walked out into the kitchen, where he found his mother with a frightened expression on her face. I'm going away, Ma, he announced, and I just want to say goodbye. She threw her apron over her head and sat down suddenly and wept. He waited patiently. I might have known it, she was sobbing. Where? she finally asked, removing the apron from her head and gazing up at him with a stricken face in which there was little curiosity. I don't know. Anywhere. As he spoke, the tree across the street appeared with dazzling brightness on his inner vision. It seemed to lurk just under his eyelids, and he could see it whenever he wished. And your job? she quavered. I ain't never going to work again. My God, Johnny, she wailed. Don't say that. 
What he had said was blasphemy to her. As a mother who hears her child deny God, was Johnny's mother shocked by his words? What's got into you anyway? she demanded, with a lame attempt at imperativeness. Figures, he answered. Jess figures. I've been doing a lot of figuring this week, and it's most surprising. I don't see what that's got to do with it, she sniffled. Johnny smiled patiently, and his mother was aware of a distinct shock at the persistent absence of his peevishness and irritability. I'll show you, he said. I'm plum tired out. What makes me tired? Moves. I've been moving ever since I was born. I'm tired of moving, and I ain't going to move any more. Remember when I worked in the glass house? I used to do three hundred dozen a day. Now I reckon I made about ten different moves to each bottle. That's thirty-six thousand. Moves a day. Ten days. Three hundred and sixty thousand moves. One month, one million and eighty thousand moves. Chuck out the eighty thousand. He spoke with the complacent beneficence of a philanthropist. Chuck out the 80,000 that leaves a million moves a month, 12 million moves a year. At the looms, I'm moving twixt as much. That makes 25 million moves a year, and it seems to me I've been a-moving that way, most a million years. Now this week I ain't moved at all. I ain't made one move in hours and hours. I tell you it was swell, just setting there, hours and hours and doing nothing. I ain't never been happy before. I never had any time. I've been moving all the time. That ain't no way to be happy. And I ain't going to do it any more. I'm just going to set and set and rest and rest, and then rest some more. But what's going to come of Will and the children? She asked despairingly. That's it. Will and the children, he repeated. But there was no bitterness in his voice. He had long known his mother's ambition for the younger boy, but the thought of it no longer rankled. Nothing mattered any more. Not even that. I know, Ma, what you've been planning for Will, keeping him in school to make a bookkeeper out of him. But it ain't no use. I've quit. He's got to go to work. And after I have brung you up the way I have, she wept, starting to cover her head with the apron and changing her mind. You never brung me up, he answered with sad kindliness. I brung myself up, Ma, and I brung up Will. He's bigger than me and heavier and taller, when I was a kid, I reckon I didn't get enough to eat. When he come along and was a kid, I was working and earning. Grub for him, too. But that's done with. Will can go to work, same as me, or he can go to hell. I don't care which. I'm tired. I'm going now. Ain't you going to say goodbye? She made no reply. The apron had gone over her head again, and she was crying. He paused a moment in the doorway. I'm sure I done the best I knew how she was sobbing. He passed out of the house and down the street. A wan delight came into his face at the sight of the lone tree. Jess ain't going to do nothing, he said to himself, half aloud, in a crooning tone. He glanced wistfully up at the sky, but the bright sun dazzled and blinded him. It was a long walk he took, and he did not walk fast. It took him past the jute mill. The muffled roar of the loom room came to his ears, and he smiled. It was a gentle, placid smile. He hated no one, not even the pounding, shrieking machines. There was no bitterness in him, nothing but an inordinate hunger for rest. The houses and factories thinned out, and the open spaces increased as he approached the country. At last, the city was behind him, and he was walking down a leafy lane, beside the railroad track. He did not walk like a man. He did not look like a man. He was a travesty of the human. It was a twisted and stunted and nameless piece of life that shambled like a sickly ape, arms loose-hanging, stoop-shouldered, narrow-chested, grotesque and terrible. He passed by a small railroad station and lay down in the grass under a tree. All afternoon he lay there. Sometimes he dozed with muscles that twitched in his sleep. When awake, he lay without movement, watching the birds or looking up at the sky through the branches of the tree above him. Once or twice he laughed aloud, but without relevance to anything he had seen or felt. After twilight had gone, in the first darkness of the night, a freight train rumbled into the station. When the engine was switching cars onto the side track, Johnny crept along the side of the train. 
He pulled open the side door of an empty boxcar and awkwardly and laboriously climbed in. He closed the door. The engine whistled. Johnny was lying down, and in the darkness he smiled. 